Good morning. Let me begin by thanking you for inviting me to speak with you this morning. We had tried to get together last year, uh, but COVID interfered as it has interfered with so many things. But in any event, I'm glad to be here with you, even though it's via Zoom. I know many of you, and I'm looking forward to perhaps seeing you uh, when we can get together on the chat on Sunday morning. Since today is Valentine's Day, and since Sarah has posted my topic, you already know that we're going to take on that really, really big subject of love. After one sermon at St. Luke's, one of my parishioners said something to the effect that I talked about love a lot. In fact, as I'm remembering this, he may even have said all the time, but I had a really good comeback because there's a story told about the disciple John who lived with his community for many years. And at one point he, he was so old that they would have to bring him out on a stretcher so that he could speak to the community. And at one of those meetings, the story goes that one of his followers asked him the same question. How come you're always talking about love? And the answer was because there isn't anything else. So I'm gonna suggest that we spend our time together thinking about love. Love, as you know, falls across a wide spectrum. On one hand, we might casually say, gosh, I really love your new dress. And then way on the other hand, we hear the biblical command to love your enemies. English is a bit impoverished here. We have pretty much just that one word, love and it's made to carry a lot of freight. You may remember that the Greeks had at least four words for love, eros for passionate and romantic love and philia for the kind of love between friends and storge for the kind of love parents have for their children and agape, that selfless disinterested kind of love. I'd like to focus on just a couple of those more closely. The kind of love I mentioned when I said I really love your new dress doesn't really count because I think that's just kind of a convention of language. And I think we all understand the friendship kind of love and the sort of love that parents have for their children. So I'd like to focus on Eros and Agape. We start with Eros because after all it is Valentine's Day when we are mostly celebrating that romantic kind of love. And I think it's safe to say that our culture is a bit stuck here. Um, just think for instance about popular culture, movies or novels. It's all about that romantic kind of love, sort of that starry eyed sweep off, sweep yourself off your feet kind of feeling. And I think we've probably all experienced that at some time. But in spite of the emphasis that's placed on that kind of love, I don't think it's possible for any of us to actually live there, to stay there in that kind of love. Often though, that kind of love can mature and deepen. And when I was preparing this message, I was thinking about that poem by Elizabeth Barrett Browning, how do I love thee? Let me count the ways. I love thee to the depth and breadth and height my soul can reach. That's clearly much deeper than an infatuation. And romantic love can and hopefully will deepen. Just looking at romantic love, somebody said that there's a spectrum there uh, within that kind of love as well. And so in the beginning, it's often one person saying to the other, if you love me, you will do what I want. And then as it gets a little bit more mature, it changes to, if you love me and I do what you want, then you should do what I want. But then it can mature even further and it becomes, I will do whatever I can so that you will be a flourishing person. In general though, at least at the beginning, this kind of love is all about me and about my feelings. If you look at the Bible, led, love is a central and recurring theme. <clears throat> and in the Hebrew Bible, <clears throat> excuse me, there's that command to love God with your whole heart and your whole mind and your whole soul and to love your neighbor as yourself. 
apparently there was an exercise that biblical scholars would sometimes engage in to challenge one another to summarize the entire law. There are two stories about that. And the first one is about the Hebrew rabbi and sage Hillel. And a fellow came to him one day and he said, I'll convert to Judaism if you can tell me the whole Jewish law while you're standing on one foot. So presumably standing just on one foot, <clears throat> Hillel replied, what is hateful to you, do not do to another. That's the whole law. Now go and live it. In the New Testament, there's a similar episode <clears throat> in which the scribes and the Pharisees ask Jesus that same question. What's the summary of the law? And his answer was the same. Love the Lord your God with your whole heart and soul and mind and your neighbor as yourself. You can think, see that things get a bit broader and a bit more practical with that love of your neighbor command. If you just stuck with the love of God part, it could stay pretty abstract. So love your neighbor. And you'll remember the story, of course, it was one of the scribes who would have been a lawyer, a biblical lawyer at the time. Um, and he was present in that conversation and he asked Jesus the follow-up question. Wondering, I wonder sometimes if, if he was looking for a loophole, because he said, okay, okay, I love your neighbor as yourself. Who's my neighbor? And then Jesus tells the story of the Good Samaritan, the story where that Jewish man is set upon by robbers and left for dead, and a hated Samaritan comes along, cares for him, binds up his wounds, takes him to an inn, and leaves money there for his future care. So the lesson there, your neighbor is the one that is in front of you that you can help. And I know that you will recognize, even as I'm saying that, that in our world, which is getting smaller and smaller, that definition of neighbor includes a lot of people extending our responsibility. So love your neighbor as yourself. We're clear, we know how to love each other ourselves. We know what we need from the basics like food and clothing and shelter to the more intangible things like the need to belong, the need for security, the need for respect. So the command is simple. Extend those same things to everyone else. But then Jesus pushes us even further by saying that we should love our enemies. And I think, hmm, it's pretty hard to sign up for that one, isn't it? Walter Wink, who was a Methodist preacher, uh, wrote some really insightful books on the nature of power. And in one of those books, he talks about this, about the need to love enemies and what that actually means. And he tells a true story about a Jewish couple, Michael and Julia Weiser, and they had moved into a new home in Kansas. And they were still unpacking when they got an anonymous phone call from someone saying that they'd be story that they ever moved in. A couple of days later, they got a package in the mail with some nasty notes saying that the KKK was watching them and had with pictures of Hitler and cartoons and graphic depictions of dead Jews and blacks. One note said, the hollow hoax is nothing compared to what's going to happen to you. So they called the police and the police said it looked like the work of a fellow by the name of Larry Trapp, who was the state leader of the KKK. And he was a Nazi sympathizer, the leader of a group of skinheads and Klansmen who had been terrorizing Jews and blacks and Asians, not only in Kansas, but in neighboring Iowa. Although Trapp was confined to a wheelchair, he was still the suspect in some firebombings of several African-American homes. And it turned out that he was planning to blow up the synagogue <clears throat> where Weiser was the spiritual leader. Trapp lived alone in a drab apartment with a lot of Nazi memorabilia and Klan stuff. And he kept assault rifles and pistols and shotguns within reach in case one of his enemies got into his apartment. At some point, Trapp 
launched a white supremacist TV series on a local TV uh, channel. At that point, Weiser had had enough and he called the hotline and he left a message. And he said, Larry, do you know that the very first laws that the Nazis passed were against people like you who had physical deformities or handicaps? Do you realize that you would have been one of the first to die under Hitler? So why do you love the Nazis so much? And he hung up, but he continued his calls to that machine. And one day Trapp just picked up and he said, what the blank blank do you want? And what Weiser said, I just want to talk to you. And Trapp said, well, stop harassing me, which I think is interesting considering how much harassment he had been doing. Stop harassing me. Why are you calling me anyway? <clears throat> and Weiser replied with something that his wife had suggested. And he said, I was thinking you might need a hand with something. And I wondered if I could help. I know you're in a wheelchair and I thought maybe I could take you to the grocery store or something. Well, apparently at that, Trapp was flabbergasted and too stunned to speak. And then he said, um, well, that's okay. That's nice of you, but I'm covered. Thanks anyway, just don't call me anymore. But Weiser kept calling him. And during the subsequent call, Trapp said that he was rethinking a few things. But then he was back on the radio with the same old hateful stuff. And Weiser called him and said, you can't have been rethinking this very much and demanded an explanation. And amazingly enough, Trapp apologized and said, you know, I'm really sorry I did that. I've been talking like that my whole life. I can't help it. I'll apologize. And the next evening, Tra Trap called the Weisers and said, I want to get out, but I don't know how. So the Weisers often to go to Trap's apartment to share a meal. And when they got there, he burst into tears, took off all his swastika rings. And soon all three of them were hugging and crying and laughing together. Trap actually resigned from all those racist organizations and he wrote apologies to the many people he had harmed. And then just a few months later, he learned that he had only a short time to live. And when that happened, the Weisers invited him to come and live with them. And Julie cared for him until he died. It turned out that Trapp had been brutalized by his father and had been an alcoholic since the fourth grade. And somehow the love that was offered to him by the Weisers broke through what he had become and freed him to be what we would call a beloved child of God. Having said that though, I can only imagine how difficult that whole thing must have been and how much insight and courage it took for the Wisers to reach out to an enemy that they somehow were able to see as a neighbor to be loved. We started talking about love with the idea of romantic love which is primarily a feeling. But if you think about love more broadly, it's much more than a feeling. And I have come to think about it primarily as the recognition of connection. First, the recognition. You might say that we are all brothers and sisters, but then that initial recognition has to be followed by a further recognition that because we are brothers and sisters, because we are connected, we are responsible for one another. So love is both a noun and a verb. Recognition needs to issue in action. I'd like to close with a final biblical quote. You may remember when Jesus asked Peter, not once, but three times, if Peter loved him. And each time when Peter said, yes, I do love you, Jesus responded by saying, feed my lambs. Once more, love issuing in active service. I think that can be a very daunting challenge, but what our world desperately needs right now are people who are up for that kind of a challenge. We are the people and this is the time. Thank you.